Good evening and welcome to another Word Up Bible study. I have been uh, anticipating. I hope you're excited about the depth of this topic that we're dealing with these next two weeks. Uh, this is a three-week series entitled How to Get Victory Over Anxiety, Stress, and Fears, or Stress, Anxiety, and Fear, whatever you want to call it, the big three. So you need to let somebody know that we're continuing this exciting topic. But I think besides just being exciting, it's a relevant and needed topic. Uh, I've been talking to a lot of folk and just a lot of things have been happening in my life. I know you're with me here. So we're going to go right into the word of God, right into this study. But help me as you bow in a word of prayer. Let's pray. Father God, again, we call for your presence. Um, we thank you, Lord, that you are still the God who has all power. You're in control of our lives. You're in control of our minds. You're in control of the situations that we are living through. Uh, Lord, somebody who is here tonight who've come to this study may find themselves in a position where they're dealing with some anxieties that can't go away, that won't go away, some fears that continue to plague them, or they're stressed out to the place that they feel that their life the quality of their life is being hampered. Lord, allow the principles, the teaching in this study to bless them and let them know that you not only will help them handle all of their stresses, all of their fears, but you will also give them the victory over these situations. I thank you now, Lord, bless my mind and bring back to my remembrance and to those who are listening, Lord, allow the word to hit exactly what they need. We thank you, Father. Thank you for your presence in Jesus' name. Amen. Grab your Bibles and go to John 14. Our text we start off with, this text seen in the light of our stresses and in our anxieties and our fears, this text will help you get another level of confidence in the fact that God wants to bless you and bring you through these situations. Let's start at verse 1, and I'm going to do a King James version uh, for tonight right now. Let not your heart be troubled. You believe in God, believe also in me. In my Father's house are many mansions. If it were not so, I would have told you. I go to prepare a place for you. And if I go and prepare a place for you, I will come again and receive you unto myself, that where I am, there you may be also. And whither I go, you know, and the way you know. Thomas said unto him, Lord, we know not whither thou goest, and how can we know the way? Jesus said unto him, I am the way, the truth, and the light. No man comes unto the Father but by me. If you had known me, you should have known my Father also, and from henceforth you know him and have seen him. Philip said unto him, Lord, show us the Father. And it will be sufficient. Jesus said unto him, How have I been so long time with you, and yet thou hast not known me, Philip? He that has seen me has seen the Father. How sayest thou then, Show us the Father? Believe thou that not that I am in the Father, and the Father in me? The words that I speak unto you, I speak not of myself, but the Father that dwells in me, he doeth the works. Believe me that I am in the Father, and the Father in me, or else believe me for the very works sake. Verily I say unto you, he that believeth on me, the works that I do, shall he do also, and greater works than these shall he do, because I go unto my Father. And whatsoever you shall ask in my name, that will I do, that the Father may be glorified in the Son, if you shall ask anything in my name, I will do it. Tonight, we are looking at the second part of this study of how God is saying anxiety, stress, and fears are not something I want my children dealing with. I want my children to have victory over them. If you are a child of God, tonight I'm going to show you certain biblical principles that will help you understand how to overcome and how to get some peace and victory. I'm telling you, there is victory and peace in the word of God. We live in a world where anything can happen. We live in a world where 
right now, the very foundations of our world are just being shaken. And personally, your world, the foundation, the bottom can drop out at any moment. So many deaths, so many people struggling with their finances or their jobs or their children. You name what it is you're dealing with. And, you know, one of the themes that I've seen, especially in this pandemic, is relationships, the struggles that we're going through. And it has left a lot of people, listen to me in case you fit this, confused, terrified, don't know where they're going, scared, anxious, and don't know if they can go on. Now, I told you last week, just a recap, you can try medication, and I hope you do if you need it. They will give you some form of relief. You can try new relationships. You can try listening to soft music. You can try meditation, mindfulness. You can try uh, starting a new hobby. You can try getting new, all of that. And I'm telling you, those things are good, but they only give you relief. They don't give you long-term. They're coping mechanisms. But if you understand the word of God, God said, I want to take you from masking the symptoms with the things you're doing. That's why you're still anxious. That's why stuff is still going on to a place of victory where you're not masking it, but you understand the root causes of what's going on. I recommend to you tonight, try all those things, not downing any of them, but there's only one place you can get to the root cause and change your life, and that is the word of God. I'm not saying that you will never, ever have to deal with anxiety, fears, and struggles. That's silly. We live in a sinful world. It's going to happen, but you will have the tools to handle it. It, it, it's almost like when uh, we were first in our marriage, we were raising our kids, and we were just starting our careers. So we didn't have real good jobs, but we still had bills. We had electric bills and gas bills and car notes and mortgage. Bills don't care, you know, how much money you're making. But I remember that back then we had a lot of times we were just beating the shutoff notices. I mean, you know, we, we would get paid and make sure we pay the bills, and we are paying them the best we could. But it was very stressful trying to keep all the bills and all the things done. I can remember those times as if yesterday. But as we grew older, as we got better jobs, as we got into better position, we got raises, we found ourselves able to pay our bills. Now, I'm not saying that the bills disappeared. I'm saying now the relief, the peace comes when you have the ability or have the money to pay the bills. Same thing in your life. You can try all that other stuff, but Jesus is just like that raise. Jesus is coming in telling you, now you have the resources to deal with. Somebody's going to get this tonight. You have the resources to deal with what you're going on. Once you learn these principles, you are going to have victory. Let's get into this text. John 14, as I shared with you, was happening, if you understand the context, it started in chapter 13 with Jesus sitting down to the Last Supper. It was just after the Passover. He knew he was about to go to the cross. And now he wanted to sit down and have his final meal with his disciples. And as he sat down with his disciples, it was there that he made a statement to them that rocked their world. So the context of this is the disciples are sitting in a place where everything they depended on for the last three years, everything they learned is now being taken away from them. Jesus said, I'm going away. They knew that they thought he was going to be the Messiah. He was going to usher in a new age where they were going to be free. But he found himself sitting in a position, they found themselves now, where if he left, they were going to be persecuted. If he left, they were going to be associated with a man who could not do it, a false prophet. They sat there wondering what was going to happen. For three years, they saw him open blind eyes, raise the dead, raise up Lazarus. And now he's telling them he's leaving, and they left everything to be with him. They were in a place where their life was stressed out. They were full of anxiety and fear about the future. They had walked with him for three years. And now, how can I be with God? How can I be with Jesus, giving him my everything, and still be living like this? I'm going to answer that question. I know you asked it, so I want you to hear it. Many of us don't understand. This is a great place for me to say that is having a walk with God, having being born again, being a Christian, being a believer does not make you exempt from the situations and trials and struggles that happen with anxiety, fears, and stresses. As a matter of fact, as you are trying to achieve your walk in God and get better, the strength, the anxieties, and the stresses may come more, but you need to understand what God said. It doesn't make you exempt, but you have the power to overcome. The reason you haven't gone under yet, the reason you're still surviving now, the reason you faced 
all of the things you face, and you're still able, able to smile tonight. The reason you look around and got a roof over your head and food in the cupboard and things that you have is because even with all you face, having God been good, having God brought you through what he said, but you need to get a new perspective about suffering. As a matter of fact, what's driving a lot of people from the church now, especially a lot of carnal people, is they don't understand the power of suffering. They don't understand how we've gotten better through suffering. And, and it's funny to me because all the Christians like to run around and we quote this phrase and we start hollering. It's a verse that we lean on. And you'll shout right now if I say it. Many are the afflictions of the righteous. Excuse me? Many are the afflictions of the righteous. Okay, so many are the afflictions of the righteous, but just not you. Many are the afflictions of the righteous, but the Lord delivers him out of them all. Now, we shout over the fact that the Lord delivers him out of them all, but we're, we're, you don't want any afflictions. How come you can say the word tells you there's going to be many afflictions, but all you want to focus on is the deliverance? What God is telling you is the shout, the ability, the promise is the fact that even when afflictions come, they won't hurt you because God's going to deliver you. God's going to bring you through. But what we have to do is stop acting like we're not going to have any afflictions. If we let those afflictions tie our mind up, we find ourselves going through changes. Things you should have overcome, you're still going through. Can't sleep at night. Still dealing with the same. You overcame something five or six years ago. The enemy will bring it back. You do know the devil said, I will return. Are you listening to me? You're already delivered. You're already blessed. Why are you letting him return? Second Corinthians. Chapter 10, verse 4 and 5. Listen to it. Turn to it. Read what it says. It says that we need to understand the weapons of our warfare. You're going to be in a warfare, but your weapons are not carnal. They're not weak. They're not fleshly. They're mighty through God to the pulling down of strongholds. If the enemy can get you to believe that you won't be delivered, then you will be stuck in the same position on autopilot, allowing the enemy to come in and ruin your life when he can, and you're walking around talking about, I don't know why I need more medication. I don't know what's going on in my life. You got to put just as much emphasis on the word of God as you do for that battle, as you do for trusting the worldly, situ the worldly remedies that you're using. Some of us trust our doctor more than we trust God. And we find ourselves in this situation. Watch this. Many are the afflictions of the righteous, right? But it says that the weapons of our warfare are not carnal, but mighty through God to the pulling down of stronghold. Here's what you have to do. Once you get God, you can do this. Casting down imaginations, right? It says that you can bring every thought captive to the obedience of Christ. I'm still on 2 Corinthians 10, 4, 5. You, you see me quoting this verse because I have to live by this verse. You don't know the higher you are in God, the stronger you get in the word of God, the more devils you're going to have to deal with, the more struggles you're going to have to deal with, but the more power you should also have. So when you get that verse, make it one of your verses that you live by. Here's what it says, casting down imaginations and bringing every thought that it would exalt itself against the knowledge of God and bring it captive and obedient to the word of Christ. So our weapons, I'm going to teach you the weapons tonight. Our weapons are not carnal. Don't sit here like this is another Bible study. This might be a life or death. This might be the difference between you walking around having another anxiety attack or having a, a moment where you don't know where the anxiousness came from or having a moment where the stress has messed up the quality of your life to you understanding how to live. These disciples, he had to tell them because that's what they were taken back. They were taken because they didn't understand it. Romans 8.18 8, Yet what we suffer now is NIV is nothing compared to the glory he will give us later. If you could get a whole new feel on suffering with the perspective of understanding that God uses that suffering to make us stronger, that we can rejoice in our suffering, then the anxiety couldn't grip you as hard because you would understand where I'm taking you at tonight. What happened at that Passover supper? It found out that uh, when supper was done, it says in the scripture, verse 2 of chapter 13, the devil entered Judas. When the devil entered Judas, Jesus got up, girded himself, washed their feet. In that, you know, Peter howled out, don't wash my feet. And Jesus said, if I don't wash you, have a part with me. Then he sat back down. Here's where the trauma started. And he said to them, one of you shall betray me. And then he said, who is I? Who is it? Who is it? And he said, the one that I dip and give this sop to. He gave it to Judas. 
They didn't understand that the plan of redemption was being put into play there. And Judas walked out. Jesus said to him, whatever you do, do quickly. He didn't say this in John. He said it in the other gospel. Go and do quickly. They didn't understand where Judas was going. But Jesus then told them, I'm going away. And that's when Peter said, look, where are you going? Why can't we go with you? And Jesus said, well, you can't go with me where I'm going now. He wanted them to know, I want to spend these last quality time with you. But the last verse of chapter 13 even gave them more trauma. Because the last verse of chapter 13 is when Peter said to him, uh, I think it's around verse 38, Lord, uh, if everybody denies you, I won't. And that's when Jesus said to Peter the first time, or in John's gospel, he said, Peter, you, you won't deny me, huh? You'll, live, you'll give your life for me. He said, no, Peter, before the crow, um, before the crow cocks twice, you shall, deliver, you shall deny me three times. Isn't that something? Before the cock crows twice, you shall deny me three times. Then we go to this person. Now, you see the trauma? Peter, now Peter can't handle it. How come I go to handle it? And they were all shook up. That's when Jesus said, let me give you a remedy for handling your stress and your, str and your struggles and your anxiety. Let not your heart be troubled. He gave them. He was showing them that you don't have to let your heart be troubled. That you can. Now, when we say let, this is not something easy to do until you take in these principles. And after I share with you that the first principle we looked at from verses 1 down to verse 7 was one of the main reasons you get stuck with a lot of stress and anxiety and fear is because in reality, maybe you don't mention it, but you really don't trust in the sovereignty of God to run your life. You really don't believe God sometimes knows what he's doing. Well, he acts like that. Or you really don't believe that God has your best interest at heart. Sometimes you really believe. You lose sight of the fact that the enemy is not as strong as God, but you really don't believe in the sovereignty of God. Last week, we took you through the sovereignty of God, and that was the first point. Tonight, we're going to give you the second reason in this text, the second principle. The first principle is please understand and trust in the sovereignty of God. He's got a plan to cover everything the enemy throws at you. Now you need to understand something else, that one of the main purposes that God has in our life is in this text begin at verse 8 we're going to talk about God's gift of deliverance that he gave to us oh yeah that's good listen to me one of the things the central theme of the redemptive power of God the central theme in the Bible is one that the enemy wants to throw a smoke screen on but that central theme in the Bible is the fact that God died so we could be delivered Deliverance is what God does. How are you sitting there thinking God won't deliver you? Well, that's the whole reason he came here so he could deliver you. You got to claim your deliverance. I need somebody right now. Claim your deliverance. How you claim it? First, you got to start speaking. it. Then you got to get to the point where you believe it in your heart. But first, you got to have enough courage to speak it. Somebody just say, I'm delivered right now. I need the person who's going through some struggles right now, who's going through this circular problem that keeps happening in your life where the enemy comes in, making you think you lost control. Let him know. Let yourself know. Talk to your own mind. I am delivered. Say, just like you do when you take any other medicine. I am delivered. Why? Because God's main theme was to, is to deliver us. Everything in the Bible from God giving his son is so you wouldn't sit there like that. Fear is not from God. Anxiety is not from God. Stress is not from God. As a matter of fact, everything in the Bible teaches us that God doesn't want us in that position. He never wants you having a nervous breakdown. He never wants you to a place where you can't live right. He never wants you with a quality of life that's less than peace and joy. Verse 8 says this. Here's the problem. Philip said, follow me on verse 8. Said to Jesus, Lord, show us the Father. This is Jesus said, I'm the way, the truth, and the life. You got to love me. He says, show us the Father and it will be enough. Look at the statement. He's sitting there with Jesus. He said, Jesus, show us the Father and that will be enough. That's just like us. We always tell God, it's like we don't, we're thankful for what we have from God now. Or we're not in a position where we think what God has given us is enough. Or we forget that God has already done some things in our life. And we always want this special revelation. 
We, we want God. Uh, Lord, I know you delivered me last time, but right now I'm going through this. Show up, God. And we get into this pity mode and this whining mode and this crying mode. And God, and we sit there and don't understand. Jesus said, I'm going away. And Philip misunderstood by saying, show us the Father. Here's what Jesus is saying. You're not satisfied when you get into a struggle. Your, your struggle in time come. How come you aren't satisfied with what God has already done in your life, with the love he's already shown you, with the peace he's already given you to make you think that he can't do it again? It's almost like we forget. They have been walking with Jesus, and now they're telling Jesus after all the miracles, after all the time he's talking about God, show us the Father. That's what we do. Don't, yes, you do. You get into a situation where you can tell God, all I need is this guy. All I need is what? That's why people run to all these you know, uh, miracle ministries, all the ministries want to give you signs and wonders because like you're not satisfied with the fact that God took a wretch like you and saved you already. You're not satisfied with the miracles and stuff God already has in your life. You always want God to show you some more. I'm glad you joined me tonight. You're going to need this. I want you to go to Luke 17, 15 and watch this. When we forget what God has done already, anxiety and stress will take over our life. Because we'll deal with this moment as a new moment. Hallelujah. When it's not a new moment, it's the same old enemy coming back to steal what God has for me. Did you get that? It's the same enemy coming back to try to steal what God has for me. Luke 17, 15. You know the story. It, Jesus was going through Jerusalem and he saw 10 lepers. And those 10 lepers were leprous. They were outcasts. They were scarred up. They were about to die. They were headed in a bad way. And these 10 lepers came to Jesus. He had compassion on them. Wow. He looked at them and said, show you, go show yourself to the priest and you shall be healed. They all went away healed. But if we pick up verse 15 of the Gospel of Luke, chapter 17, it says, And one of them, when he saw that he was healed, that is so good, turned back with a loud voice, and glorified God, and fell down on his face at his feet, giving thanks. And he was a Samaritan. And Jesus answering him said, Were there not ten cleansed? But where are the other nine? We look at how uh, disrespectful these leopards are, how ungrateful they are, and we sit in this high seat of judgment. How could those leopards do that? But do you realize many of us, this one leper that came back demonstrated what real worship is. Many of us, when we got to the point of being healed, the same thing happened to us that happened to these lepers. Let me break it down for you. Leprosy is a terrible disease. Your, your skin starts falling off. Your appendages start falling off. You, you have to wrap yourself in bandages to hold yourself together. There's scars. There's pus. There's bleeding. And you're barely walking. You're an outcast. You can't be around anybody. Here comes Jesus and heals you. And all of a sudden, these lepers, nine of them, can you see them? Man, they looked down at their hands. I look good. They looked around at their feet saying, I look good. And they decided that they looked so good, they got all caught up in the healing and didn't come back to thank him. So what happened? The prosperity of the healing was thinking, they were thinking about more than they were thinking about the healer. Did you catch that? Here is the problem. When a person finds themselves, we're used to God treating us well, that we take God for granted when we're doing well, but as soon as the struggle comes, we fall apart and start asking why, God, why, but we didn't do what this leper did. We're just as guilty because we allow prosperity to be the call and not our worship of God. Did you catch that? If you are a worshiper, you'll follow the, what this leper did. Look what the leper did that came back. It said, and one of them turned back. Somebody say, turn back. If you could just stop right now and think of something God has done in your life. I want you to be in this Bible study and, and say, you know what? I never turned around and thank God for that. I'm here dealing with something new. I'm struggling with something else, but I never gave God praise for that. I want you to think of one thing God did right now and praise him for that and say, Lord, I'm sorry that I didn't turn back. I found myself in the same condition. We want to keep going on. So we say we're looking for that prosperity. Lord, get us back to well. Give me back to heal. And we forget. 
That is not the prosperity. That is the blessing. It is the healer. But look what he did. He turned back. He fell on his face. He gave thanks. That's what worship is. And you won't forget God if you do. But we allow the prosperity to make us forget God. Philip said, show us the Father. God said, haven't I done enough already? You don't believe it? Look at verse 9. Jesus said unto him, have I been with you so long, you still do not know me? Isn't that something? Whoever has seen me has seen the Father. How can you say, show us the Father? Do you not believe that I am in the Father and the Father in me? The words that I say unto you to speak of my own authority, but of the Father's authority. Stop right there. Here's what he's saying. You forget what God has done. But even worse, in verse 9, Jesus is saying, you forget what I've done already. And when you forget what I've already done, now you forget what I can do. You know why you're sitting there hurting now, acting like it's the end of the world? Because you forget about the power God already gave you. Jesus told his disciples, he said, look, you've seen me talk to my father. You've seen me go off and pray every morning. You've seen the miracles, the miraculous. You've seen lives change. You've seen your heart change. I let you in to see stuff other folk haven't seen. Can I stop and say that's what God is saying to you? How can you sit here now and allowing all of this pressure to be in your life, not believing that I still want to deliver you? We're talking about deliverance. Not believing that if I did it once, I can do it again. Not believing. How can you sit here believing that this can get you when nothing else did because I was in your life? You should have had a discernment to know I've been with you. Where the folk that'll just put something and say, I know God has been walking with me. I know it was God. I know it was God who held me. Anybody had a moment like that? I know it was God who got me through that. Anybody had a moment like that? I'm just trying to get your remembrance going. I'm trying to get you to point to understand that even though it's bad now, you're going to get victory over this stuff when you start remembering what God has already done. And when you remember that, you remember what God can do. That's what he was saying to them in verse 9. Don't you remember? The Father had to be in me with the things that was going on. He said, don't complain. Don't get upset. Just remember what I can do and go for it. Deuteronomy chapter 6, verse 10 to 12. The sixth chapter of Deuteronomy is a chapter um, where they were about to go into the promised land. They were going to head to the promised land. And Moses was explaining to them how to be obedient and follow the laws of God. As a matter of fact, verse 4 and 5 is called, the, in the Hebrew, is the Shema, or the understanding that the Lord thy God is one God. But I don't want to focus on those verses. I want to focus on verse 10 through 12. This is what God said. Whenever you get yourself down, whenever you sit there talking about where is God, whenever life looked like it took a wrong turn, Deuteronomy chapter 6, verse 10 and 12, listen to what he said. And it shall be when the Lord thy God shall have brought thee out into the land, which he swore unto your fathers, to Abraham, to Isaac, to Jacob, to give thee great and goodly cities, which thou buildest not, houses full of good things, which thou filled not, wells digged, which you did not dig, vineyards, olive trees, which you did not plant, when thou shalt have eaten and been full. There's the problem. God said, do you remember how many times I filled your cover? Remember how many times I was there for you? Remember all of the ways I met your needs and you did not have to do them? I did some things in your life already that should tell you, don't be anxious. I got you. I got this. All I mean is you need to realize God got this. If you can just get your mind and your heart to be in a symbiotic relationship, when your spirit can tell your head and your head can talk to your spirit and say, God got this. Somebody needs a shout out in the middle of your next, next anguishing situation, in the middle of your cry, just howl it out. God's got this. And when you do, back it up with some scripture. Jesus just said, I've given you covers that you didn't fill. I've given, God has given you gas in your car that you didn't earn. God has given you a house that you might not have been able to afford. God has taken you through situations that were miraculous. Somebody got a miracle they can understand. And if you know those miracles are there, why would you be anxious about this time? Listen. The enemy is going to speak to your mind. That's his job to try to tell you, oh, this is so bad. Nobody can get through this. But God is saying, don't you remember? He said, therefore, 
lest you forget, verse 12, the Lord which brought thee forth out of the land of Egypt from the house of bondage. God is saying when you get to those places, not only think about what I've done, but think about what I can do. I got all power in my hand. God can go in my mind. He's a mind regulator. God can go in my heart. He wants me to have peace. And I want you to look particularly at the things they said God has already done in your life. There's some people I'm talking to. If you would encourage somebody, didn't God go into that operation with you? Didn't he go to the hospital with you? Didn't God heal you? Can you say thank you? There's somebody I'm talking to tonight. Wasn't there a moment in your life when you were about to give up, but somehow God brought you back? He threw out a lifeline? Come on, we're just talking about why we shouldn't be anxious. Isn't there a time when you were so low, God carried you? That's why I'm telling you, don't be anxious. I'm giving you principles. And the first principle is, don't forget what God has done. The second principle is, don't forget what he's done, because then you won't remember what he can do. How do I forget God? I want you to write these things down. Here is how we forget God. Number one, when you do this, anxiousness is going to take over. But number one, when we forget that we are in the presence of God. Christ has always told us, God has said, you're all, when you realize, even when this stuff is going on, I'm in the presence of my God who loves me. And because of his presence, I can have rest. I want you to write down Exodus 33, verse 14. And he said, my presence shall go with you, and I will give you rest. God said, I'm going to give No, a sleeping pill can give you sleep, maybe. God said, I will give you rest. Rest in biblical form is not just laying down at night. Rest is walking through the day. When struggles are going on and still knowing that there's a God who can bless you. But when we forget, here's how anxiousness comes. When you forget God, you first of all forget that you're in his presence. God's presence is all around you right now. Secondly, we forget God in worship. Now don't miss this. When we forget God in worship, we forget. Sometimes worship is on autopilot. You know, we're so used to saying hallelujah, thank you God, worship. But when we get in trouble. How many of you know there's been a moment when I worshiped and that worship was power packed? That worship was full. That, that worship was, was mighty because I was hurting and I called down some God. Why don't you do that all the time? I had to ask myself that. Why do you wait till you're about to fall down before you worship with some intensity? Why do you wait until the bottom falls out and you feel hopeless before you'll start worshiping the same way you would? Psalms 22, verse 3. You know the verse. It says, but thou art holy. Psalms 22, verse 3. Thou art holy, O thou that inhabits the praises of Israel. Here's what he said. God, you're such a holy God that even when Israel was doing wrong, if they turned around and praised you, you would inhabit that praise. And with your praise came power. You remember Joshua around the walls of Jericho. So when you get in trouble... Okay, first of all, you forgot what God did. You forgot what God can do because you forgot what God did. Now you're sitting there forgetting that you're in his presence. But then when you praise, make sure you praise with intentionality. Praise believing, you know what? I'm going to praise and worship God because God's power will come on the scene. You can bring God on the scene by worship. So why, instead of sitting down crying, why don't you try worship? Uh, and, and if somebody's, you know, cramping your style... You know, because you want to get in alone and have an audience with God. Go to a secret place somewhere and just begin to worship. I'm telling you, it works. God will come down in a form and a force that will bring you to a place of stability. And lastly, we forget. And here's the, here's the one that you cannot forget. God's redeeming love. Can I tell you the one thing you can count on, no matter what the devil says, is God loves you. No matter what you can count on, Understand when I said redeeming love. You know what redeeming love means? It means that God thought so much of you that he sent his only begotten son and he wanted to redeem you. We're still talking deliverance. I'm telling you the second reason why you should not be anxious from this text is because you need to remember that God died so I could be delivered and I'm going to take charge and believe that deliverance. That is the evidence of God being with us. His redeeming love. If anybody 
had a reason to question God's love, it was Job. Now, I just want to say this because many of you may think because of how bad your experience is, you had a Job experience, but you need to go back and reread Job. But even if you did have a Job experience, can I explain to you theologically that Job experience was for our learning? So the Job experience also was God training and teaching Job, but also giving us an understanding of how awesome he was. But if you had a Job experience, you ought to be like Job if you want to identify. Because when his, when his money was gone, when his family was gone, when his health was gone, that's when he fell into that psychological stage, which all of us fall into, where sometimes we're walking around in a daze and I got hit with something and I'm telling you, it's real. Death can shake you. Divorce can shake you. A child going astray can shake you. Not having enough money to pay your bills and losing things can shake you. Not being able to sleep and don't know why can shake you. Fear coming out of nowhere can shake you. Anxiety that you thought you beat and it comes back again can shake you. But how do I get out of that? Do what Job did. Write this text down, Job 19.25. He said, with everything going on in my life, with how bad this moment is, I'm about to tell you something. He said, I know my Redeemer lives, and at the last, he will stand upon the earth. Here's what Job did. He reaffirmed his faith in God in the middle of his tragedy. I'm sorry, that's how I feel during this Bible study because this is personal to me. I just want to stop some time and have you take a moment of worship and just reaffirm some things in your spirit. One of the things you need to understand is no matter how bad things are, I still believe in God. I still believe God can do it. I still believe my Redeemer is living and here's the key to him living. He loves me. I'll tell you right now, this is a good reason that you should not be anxious and let the fears and the anxiety get you because of the fact that we were born to be delivered. I hope you're catching this. And the final evidence in these first verses from verse 8 down to verse 10, 9, 10, 11, watch this, is the fact in this section, Jesus started off. And I get to the verse, um, yes. Verse 12, we just talked about, believe thou me, I'm in the Father. We read through that. Believe that I am in the Father and the Father in me. It starts at verse 12. I want you to see something in verse 12. It says, verily, verily, the words that Jesus began with is another way that you know he's trying to bring you back to the reality of how much he loves you and how strong it is. He said, verily, verily, the word verily, actually transliterated into Hebrew is amen, amen. It, it's, it's Jesus saying, this section I'm about to say, whenever you hear Jesus saying truly, truly, he's saying amen, amen. When he says verily, verily, what he's telling you is, he's saying this passage is so important, you need to understand it. He said this is powerful. Pay attention to this passage. Let's read 12 through 10. Verily, verily, I say unto you, he that believeth on me, the works that I do, shall he do also. And greater works than these shall he do, because I go to my Father. There, and, verse 13, Whatsoever you shall ask in my name, that will I do, that the Father may be glorified in the Son. Verse 14, If you ask anything in my name, I will do it. We need to talk about this. Jesus said, okay, um, remember in, in my in, in deliverance that um, remember what I've already done. Remember what I can do. I, I have power. Remember um, that you're in my presence. Remember that when you worship me, I'll show up. Remember that I love you with all my heart. He said, but finally, I need you to remember that with this gift of, of deliverance I've given you, it's based on my finished work. It's based on the fact that I went to the cross and won for you what I'm telling you you had. Peace. I won that peace for you. Own it. I won a good night's sleep for you. I won your ability to cast out devils. I won your ability to bounce back from any tragedy. I won for you the ability to cast out. I won the ability for you to be able to hold up. 
under the most stressful situation, rebound and come out better than you were before. I know I got somebody in there who can give me an amen or just kind of understand in the chat, give me a high five to say, I know that's right. We're the real people that ain't scared to say, I have not been a super Christian. I've been in some situations where I've been down. I've been in some places where I've walked around a day, a couple weeks, a month. Can I hear six months? Can I hear one year? Can I hear a couple of years that I just had to rely on God just to make it through my daily routines? Be honest. There's a whole lot of folk out there that just won't be honest with you. And he said, okay, but remember this. If you rely on my finished work, there's some power that comes to let you know you are made for deliverance. What is the power? Read the text. He said, if you believe in me, and the works that I do, you should do. Here's what Jesus was saying. He wasn't telling you that he was a vending machine. That's why we get in trouble. He wasn't telling you that you go around just ask for anything you want to ask for. That's not, no. Some people have interpreted that, but that is not theologically what this text is saying. He's not saying that you can just walk around. He starts off by giving you the parameters of being able to use his authority that he won at Calvary. And that's what this is about. He said, you can use my authority to get out of your situation, but you can only believe it. And he started out, barely, barely, if you believe in me and the works that I do, then you can do them. Do you understand that? Here's what he's saying. I'm not giving you a carte blanche check. I'm saying, if you believe in me, me as your savior, me as the Messiah, me as the one setting up the plan of redemption, and then you believe in the works that I did. What was his works? Bringing people to God. Making sure people were saved. Making sure poor were fed. Making sure those who are lost and destitute and hungry. He said, when your mind frame gets to the point that it's not just about you, I'm helping somebody. You know why you're all tied up in that anxiety? All tied up in that fear? Because every day you put more and more pity on your pity fire. More and more wood. It's all about you. But God said, no, if you believe in me and the works that I did, man, some power is going to come in your life. Here's what he said. If you believe in me and the works that I did, the same works you can do. The works that I did. What works did he do? I just share with you. You got to get to the point that you're a believer who wants to see the kingdom of God come to pass. Who wants to see the church prosper so the church, which is the only light in the land, can save people. You want to see other people come to Christ. You want to see other people prosper. And you don't just want to see the good and well-to-do and well-off people doing good. You want to go out to the dregs of society and those who are lost. And you want to make sure every moment that you have, somebody else is finding a way to salvage their life. Jesus said, when you get to that point, then you can do the same works that I do. This is powerful. He left us instructions. You know, I remember how people make this spooky. Somebody said, well, Jesus said we can do the same works you do. I'll never forget, someone had lost a loved one. And I was called in to pray, and there were other ministers there. I was called specifically. I want to give this to you because this is really frightening, but it's how the kingdom is, has been put in, in, into line now. It's what makes people go off the deep end because some of that stuff is not theological and it's just not real. And we were sitting there, and I remember they were on, they were on a ventilator, and they had died. And they called us in, and I was praying. And I prayed the prayer. And I, I forget all the words of the prayer, but I remember saying what I consider to be the most strongest and surefire way to get a blessing than any other way. And don't let anybody else fool you. I said, and God, as we're standing here, we gave him all of our wishes. And then I said, let your will be done. Amen. Now, if you don't understand that, I had a preacher standing there tell me, no, man. That, that, that was a weak prayer. You know, you're supposed to ask for what we want. I said, I did. I said, but don't you think God's will, which is the final authority, has to play into this? He said, I'm going to go back in there and tell them we're going to pray to raise, raise this person up. I said, no, you're not. How can you raise up somebody if God doesn't raise them up? We've already prayed the prayer that said, God, let you. See, what happens is, watch this. Now, some people want to call that anti-faith. Here's what it is. You believe somehow that you're stronger than what the word of God's going to do. And when we get to that point that we don't believe in God's ability, then we think it's our ability. I'll give you a better text. James chapter 5, verse 13 and 15. I believe in healing, deliverance, power. I believe in all of that. 
But do you know what I also believe? That if God, God's will comes through our prayer and our belief and trust in him. But we're telling somebody, you're going to go in there and promise those folk that their loved one will be raised up from the dead when God's saying, that's my decision. So I left it in God's hand. If they've been raised up, hallelujah. But I prayed the prayer, deliver, and I prayed the prayer, it will be done. Look at James chapter 5, verse 13 and 15. God gives us an order. Somebody say order. So you don't get left out there in a disillusion. He said, is any sick among you? Any afflicted among you? Verse 13, let him pray. Any merry, let him sing psalms. Is any sick among you? Let him call for the elders of the church. Let them pray over him, anointing him with oil in the name of the Lord. And the prayer of faith shall save the sick and the Lord shall raise him up. Can you hear me? So you don't get unbiblical. The prayer of faith shall save the sick, but the Lord has to raise him up. And if he has committed sins, that's not our job. They shall be forgiven. Who's going to forgive the sin? The Lord. Here's what I'm trying to tell you. The reason we're anxious is we bought into this thing that we can do it over what God's word is saying. When you need to understand God is the one that's doing it. And if I pray the prayer of faith, I'm trusting God can do anything. If God wanted to raise that child up, I'd have been sitting there praising God. But I did pray, Lord, let your will be done. And anytime we get to the point, that's how you get disappointed. I've seen people's lives change because they're saying, why didn't God show up? God has a will and a purpose that if I trust him, and I do like Jesus did, and Jesus said, if you believe in me and the works that I did, if, if, if I were Jesus, I'd be sitting there saying, Father, why did I be crucified? you my father. Can't you do this some other way and have me go to the cross? I don't understand why I got some nails through my hand. Why you got to put... Because you don't believe. Jesus said, I believe in my father. I'm trying to help somebody who gets in caught up in this, I call it false theology, telling you that you can just ask God like a vending machine. And then here's what they do. Now, I'll ask you a better question. Have you heard anybody raising anybody up from the dead? If they did, if it happened, it was God. So I need us to understand God is saying, here's the plan. Call for the elders of the church and that will work. You can do that. And when Jesus said, and greater works, Look at the text. Then these can you do. This is powerful. What are the greater works? Jesus said, the same works I did you can do. Well, Jesus said, your mind now has changed. Your whole, your whole being now wants to see people's lives change. Your whole being is not interested in getting a new car and getting a whole lot of money and getting another house. All those things come once your mind is changed in God. But the reality is, once I believe God, there's no limit. And I get a life of peace. X4. You want to know what the greater works are? The disciples had just been beaten. The apostles had just been beaten. They were told not to speak in Jesus' name anymore. Acts 4, verse 4 said this. And as they spake unto the people, the priest and the captain of the temple, Acts 4, 4, of the temple and the Sadducees came upon them, Acts 4, 1, we're going down to 4, came upon them, being grieved that they taught the people and preached through Jesus the resurrection from the dead. And they laid hands on them and put them in hold until the next day, for it was now even. Look at verse 4. How be it? Many of them which heard the word believed, and the number of the men was about 5,000. More people were saved through Peter's prayer, the greater works. The works we continue are the works of building the church. 5,000 men were saved in one day. This is not Jesus feeding the 5,000 and 4,000. This is 5,000 that came to Christ and became believers. What am I saying? God knew that he can trust us to continue his work. Somebody said, look, you want to find a road to peace? Tell yourself this. And somebody write in the chat, I'm just going to continue God's work. I'm going to do God's work. I will do God's work. Bam! Weight going to be lifted off of you right away. Because now you got that trust back in God. I won't be disappointed when my will doesn't come past. I just will trust God for his will. I don't know why God is doing it, but I got to trust what God is doing, and that will be the blessing in my life. Then he said, verse 13, And whatsoever you ask now, now that I know 
your mind, your motive, your heart, your faith is the is in me. It believes in me. And you want the work of the kingdom to be the first thing in your life. He said, now ask whatsoever you will in my name. And that will I do. Now you understand. He's not a vending machine, but he's a God who honors faith. He's a God who honors prayer. He's a God who will let you be blessed if you trust him. You know how Jesus, if you want to have the same power Jesus had, you know how Jesus got that power and how he gave us the ability to get it? If you go to Philippians chapter 2, verse 5, look what it said. Now, I didn't say this, but God is saying, okay, you want to walk and be a representative of mine? You want to continue the work that I started after I went to the cross? You want that power to walk through you? It's what he's telling the disciples. You know what he's telling the disciples is, when I leave, don't just fold up and quit. He's saying, I need you to continue my works. And here's what he said. Philippians chapter 2, verse 5. Let this mind be in you, which was also in Christ Jesus. Now stop. When your mind is being cluttered with anxiousness, fear, and desires, you got to remember that you have too much work to do to be sitting here letting fear run your life. You, you, you got too many things that God has placed in you. You got too many burdens on your shoulder that you want to happen. I wish I would spend hours allowing myself to be burdened down. No, I will fight every day if I have to to keep my mind clear because deliverance is mine. Somebody write in the chat, deliverance is mine. That's right, you're helping somebody out. Deliverance belongs to you. When you get these things in your mind, watch this, let this mind be in you, which is also in Christ Jesus, who being in the form of God, thought it not robbery to be equal with God, but made himself of no reputation, took upon him the form of a servant, and was made in the likeness of men. He's letting us know where the power come from. And being found in the fashion of a man, he humbled himself, became obedient unto death, even the death of the cross. Wherefore, Verse 9, God also highly exalted him. You want to see God highly exalt you? The scripture says, let this mind be in you that was in Christ. What, what did the mind tell him to do? I'm a servant first. Everything else is going to come. I, my, my peace will come when I get to those moments that life seems empty. I got so much work to do that I won't dwell on the negative. I dwell on the positive. I remember and I get through that. Look what he said. That at the name of Jesus, here's the name, the authority. Now I got, I got this. He gave me this. In his deliverance, he said, here's the authority. Here, here's the name you can use to get that situation out of your life. To get that monkey off your back. To get that darkness out of your life. Keep that darkness out of your bedroom. Go and anoint your house and get that enemy out of your house. Anoint your child when they're sleeping. Get that enemy off your child. Anoint your mind. When the mind is trying to go another direction, anoint your mind and bring your mind back and say, no, my mind is the mind of Christ. My mind is focused on God. He said, verse 10, that at the name of Jesus, every knee shall bow of things in heaven, things on earth, things under the earth, and every tongue shall confess that Jesus Christ is Lord to the glory of the Father. I'm going to recap. I talked to you last week about if you want to get rid of anxiousness, first put your heart. I didn't say it. Jesus said it in this text. First, understand the sovereignty of God. He was letting them know, I'm going to bring you comfort. Let not your heart be troubled. I got you. Then, he told Philip, no, he said, now, the second thing you need to understand is, I actually gave you the gift of deliverance. I'm giving you a gift that everything I'm doing is so you can walk in deliverance. Everything I'm doing is so you can be delivered. And in that deliverance, he told them, don't forget what I've already done. Then get anxious. Because if you get what I've already done, you won't forget You'll forget what I can do. And what makes you forget is when you don't remember that you're always in my presence. When you don't remember, worship brings down the power of God. Worship instead of crying. When you don't remember as you're going through your trials that God's redeeming love is the backbone of your deliverance. And then he went and said, and the final straw is, I'm now giving you that authority as a gift. You have the authority of my name mind be in you. Oh, this is this is powerful stuff. If you apply this teaching, it will bless you. This whole chapter is filled with the anointing of God. 
Don't miss next week, because next week I'm going to give you the third and final reason challenges us, and that is you're going to understand the conquering power of the Holy Spirit. Oh, I, I don't want to let too much out, but when you can't do it, the Holy Spirit's going to conquer for you. Please, um, whatever you do, practice this week from the position that I believe in sovereign God's sovereign will. I'm not going to get anxious about what my life is. And second, is I got the gift of deliverance. That's why Jesus left, so I could be delivered. And then next week, we're going to learn there's some power in the Holy Spirit, God the Holy Spirit. We're going to talk about pneumatology, the doctrine of the Holy Spirit, and how that will give us comfort and peace. This is Pastor Duncan saying, I hope you've been blessed. Please, we need your support in the ministry right now. Go to our website, Shiloh Baptist Churches, and if this message has blessed you, leave us an offering there. That will go into what we do to feed the poor. All the stuff I just talked about, you'll see that that's what our church is reaching out doing. I thank you for joining us. We count the privilege when you come on. And I hope these, these messages are blessing you. And please, if you practice this, you will get peace. Read that 14th chapter over and over again till you get to the part that says, Let not my heart be troubled. That's my wish and hope for you tonight. God bless.